2022. So 2021 was a year. And one thing I think if you're watching this, I shouldn't have to explain just why. It, sure, it was a better year than 2020, but not by that much. The little victories the year brought were genuinely welcomed and appreciated. And look, I'm not going to lie, it took a toll on me. Trust me when I say that there's a reason why I all but stopped making non-review videos for well over six months, maybe more, I haven't really counting, but it was a while, I'm sorry about that. But even if 2022 hasn't gotten off to the greatest of starts, 2021's behind us. And while the break has been great, it's time to get back to it and see just what the year has to store for us. And oh boy, there's plenty to get excited about as far as cool stuff to read, watch, play, you know the drill. But before we get to all that, I wanted to share a few things that I've been into lately why the year is still young. So with all that said, here we go. Chats out if you're an avid social media user like I am, you've probably seen people posting a series of color block emoji with a single word accompanying it. Wordle. So what's that you may ask? It's a daily word game that's become incredibly popular lately almost out of nowhere and is so simple, you'd be surprised just how big it's become. The basic goal here is you try to guess a five little word in six attempts. As you progress, letters become identified with three colors. Gray if it's not in the word, yellow if it's in the word but not in that position, and green if it's in the word and in the right position. If you're familiar with the game Mastermind or Lingo, you're on the right track. The interesting wrinkle with all this is that the puzzle updates daily and everyone has the same puzzle. While the game had been around for a while, it's the addition of a share button to genuinely made the game take off and is the smartest thing about the game. Basically because the colored squares you share out are your results, but without sharing what the word is. This is helped by the fact that people are generally good about keeping kayfabe but not just flat out spoiling the word, unless it's something shocking like including double letters or the word rebus or Americanized spellings because that always goes down super well. The emojis more or less share out your thinking process behind your attempts to solve the word and it's kind of neat to see how other people tackle the same problem. That and it's great to trade strats and opening words. So for instance, I love going for audio or do as my opening word because it has four out of five vowels so you know where you lie when it comes to those. Then you have words like stare, which tend to have some of the more repeating letters. There's a lot you can do. There's some genuine strategy here, and it's kind of really neat. What's really surprising me about Wordle, especially since it blew up, is how free it is of a lot of modern gaming's, well, bullshit. There's no competition or leaderboards. There's no stress unless you're really struggling for the word, nor are there any ads or monetization systems that you know something like this would be perfect for. To which, sure enough, You've already got people trying to cash in on this in the worst and greediest ways possible. Fun fact, the creator, a former red engineer by the name of Josh Wardle, made this as a neat thing for his wife. Great going, guys! Wardle exists as this neat little game that I'm not too sure will continue to be popular later into 2022 as it is right now, but it's been a cool game to play when I've got a few minutes to spare each day. It's been a great addition to my daily gaming habits, and it's a nice way to sharpen the mind when you've just woken up. So that was what I was playing when I woke up. But what if I was later into the day? Well... Hey yo, this is Future Jamie. Um, since I recorded all that, it turns out that uh, Josh Wardle sold, wa sold Wordle to the New York Times. So, uh, good for him, I guess. But I mean, just I hope it doesn't mean that uh, Wordle gets thrown into the New York Times paywall because they're very good about that. But hey, good on the man for getting paid. But um. Yeah, just wanted to quickly update that because um, turns out when you work on something for a while, stuff can change. So there's your update. Back to the video. Pending any delays because we live in an era where it's an actual possibility, Sony's said to have a massive 2022 with major sequels to three of their biggest properties. Our pick for Game of the Year for 2018, God of War, is getting a sequel in the form of God of War Ragnarok. Polyphony Digital is set to release the first numbered Gran Turismo game in nearly a decade. And then Horizon Zero Dawn is getting a sequel released in a handful of weeks, known as Horizon Forbidden West. Based on this, I thought it was a great time to revisit Zero Dawn, something I hadn't touched in several years after falling off it incredibly hard. You can thank playing a heap of Breath of the Wild right beforehand. Turns out this was a really great time to revisit Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, aside from the sequel coming out in a few weeks, Sony gave the game away in DLC last year. If you've got a PS5, it was part of the wave of Sony exclusives getting updates to take advantage of the more powerful hardware. Also, was the first in the wave of PlayStation ports going to the PC, so you don't even need a PlayStation to play this anymore. So, I don't have several minds about Horizon, and I'm pretty much in the same place I was back when I stopped it a few years ago. The best thing about the game for me is that it presents a really interesting world to move around in, with some striking visual design and some neat bits of lore and world building. Much like its protagonist Aloy, you want to learn more about the world and how it got to the state that it's in, and it helps that the story is decent enough to keep you wanting more. 
The gameplay sounds like a contemporary open world RPG, but it does some pretty unique things. Personal highlight for me is the unique take on the whole Ubisoft tower concept in the form of tall necks, effectively robotic brachiosauruses that patrol an area that are otherwise completely harmless. But the game presents them as a challenge to find appropriate footing to, well, mount them. Your rewards for scaling one of these tall necks, opening up more icons in the world. Look, it's a neat idea, and I appreciate it even though the world isn't all that great. The mechanic presents up as something of a puzzle, and, well, I really like getting kind of puzzles every while and just navigating the world and kind of finding new ways to explore. I think that's kind of cool, but that's just me. So don't expect that platform to be as open or as free as you'd find in something like Assassin's Creed or the like. This is the kind of game that still openly highlights which specific platforms and handholds you can use, which feels incredibly dated, even though this game is like five years old. Much like Assassin's Creed, however, the game's map can very quickly start vomiting up icons and activities, which is never a good sign. And then there's the combat, which is where the game starts to lose me a little bit. Now, it's not awful, but the game tries some ideas that I don't think feel fully formed. Because most of your encounters against robotic dinosaurs, a lot of them can sort of feel like a Monster Hunter encounter at times. Particularly against some of the bigger robots, where you're constantly dodging around and they're thrashing around in all their grandeur. Plus, there's an element of setting up traps and doing some like, prep work before a fight. That, and you can tear off parts of the dinos that you can use to help your own crafting, which you should do anyway, because those parts usually contain some of the more useful dino abilities, like, say, being able to spot you while you're stealthy. There's a reason why you should do that, you see. Now, treating it like a hunt sounds like a great idea, but the game never really feels like you have all the right tools to make these hunts feel fun or satisfying. Not to mention, I never really found the aim to be as precise or rewarding as I wanted it to be. And then the game still has regular human enemies to fight, which never really feel as fun or exciting to fight as the dinosaurs do. By far the most fascinating thing about the whole experience is that it's developer Guerrilla Games doing something radically different. Up until the release of Horizon, Guerrilla were known for two things. Incredible technology, and first person shooters. Then pivoting to a Witcher 3 style open world RPG actually works surprisingly well, and their panache for making beautiful looking games really shines here, particularly with the added challenge of making a massive, living, breathing world something that a first person shooter level, well, kind of isn't. Yeah, there's also a few quirks here that I really do hope get fixed up in the sequel. For instance, this is an open world game where fast travel is dependent on like a super item that, while it's not too hard to find or craft, and sure it does actually make some sense why it's there, it just feels really silly, you know? And that's not getting into the weird way the economy works, or the fact that none of the side activities or side quests are really super engaging. More powerful hardware and experience in this type of game, I've got faith that Gorilla knows what they can do to make Forbidden West a fantastic sequel. And I know that I'm keen to give it a go. After all, the last time that Gorilla made a sequel to a debuting IP, it resulted in the most controversial, but ultimately kind of the best game they ever made. So I'm hoping it's the same with Horizon? But before that, I'm just really hoping that Sony's big year of PlayStation exclusives really takes off and it's a good one. I, again, I'm really hyped for this. It sounds really awesome. So that's what I've been up to lately. And trust me when I say I'm excited to get back to work and do some cool stuff for this, the 10th year of New Game Plus. So hopefully the next video won't take six months to make and the rest of the year goes swimmingly, right? Right?